Hello and welcome to the Long Island Invasive Species Management Area Partners Meeting and Workshop. Due to a recording error, we can't bring you the LISMA update from December 2nd, but we'll start off today with the partner spotlight from Sabrina Cohn of the Central Pine Barrens Joint Planning and Policy Commission. Sabrina Cohn graduated from SUNY ESF in 2020 and has been working at the Central Pine Barrens Commission as Ecological Field Specialist since June 2021. In her role as Ecological Field Specialist, Sabrina assists with the planning and implementation of ecological management activities in the Central Pine Barrens, including various research and stewardship projects that foster biodiversity, natural resource conservation, and ecosystem protection and restoration. Sabrina frequently collaborates with New York State DEC, LISMA, and other partnering agencies on projects like Southern Pine Beetle Management, Thinning, Prescribed Fire, and Manual Invasive Species Removal. Now here's Sabrina on Southern Pine Beetle. Uh, the reason we focus on Southern Pine Beetle so closely is it's a huge threat to pitch pine, which is basically the keystone species of the Pine Barrens. Without that, there's no Pine Barrens. Um, and Southern Pine Beetle has really taken a liking to this tree for a few reasons. Um, so I'm not going to get too much into the identification of this beetle or its natural history, but basically it's a bark beetle that, if you don't know, um, that bores into the bark of the tree and lays its young, reproduces in the vascular system of the tree, which ultimately kills the tree. It's pretty much with pitch pine guaranteed to kill the tree. If not the beetle, then also the fungus that they carry and inoculate the tree with also kind of gums up the vascular system. Um, it looks huge on this screen, but it's the beetles are actually smaller than an uncooked grain of rice. Uh, and they mass attack the tree and that's how they're able to overcome the defense system of the tree. Um, so an um, update, you know, we've been working on with Southern Pine Beetle since 2014 when it was first detected on Long Island. Uh, and it's been a pretty wild ride up until now. Last year, we felt like we kind of had a handle on it. It didn't really, it was active, but it you know, wasn't necessarily in like full outbreak stage like this year. Um, we've had a significant resurgence and exponential growth here in this region. They can have multiple broods per season. I mean, we saw maybe up to like six broods uh, in one season this year. So moving very quickly, um, some of the really main Hot spots are along the Carmen's River corridor from South Haven County Park up into Upton, New York. And then it's kind of infringing a little bit now in Rocky Point, which is where we're kind of focusing on that leading edge where it's just entering now into the Rocky Point Pine Barrens. And we kind of really want to keep it out of there because there's a lot of dense pine in there. Um, and really the cause of this resurgence and exponential growth is an ongoing issue of overstocked stands and aging stands but also the sustained drought that we had this summer. Um, and it got so bad basically that we had to uh, reestablish an incident command system um, that's being led by DEC, um, mainly Nathan Hudson and Chris Daggerwald uh, who work primarily on the Southern Pine Beetle program with DEC and we work closely with them. So yeah, just getting into a little bit of how we monitor for SPD, uh, Bill touched on it earlier. Um, the two main ways that we do aerial surveys are through drone flights, where we take aerial photography uh, of areas that seem to be infested, again, and same with the plane uh, flights, they take photos and try to cover as much ground as possible so that then when the ground crews come to do the ground truthing, we know which areas to target and we can confirm or deny whether those uh, aerial photos were uh, you know, catching the infestations or other types of bark beetles. Um, and then basically once we're on the ground, um, Sam and I, along with the EC crew, we grid out a, a large area and we move across it and, and scan the crowns mainly for yellowing red crowns or uh, groups of standing dead trees. And then once we find those infestations, we flag them for suppression and all infested trees along with a buffer are cut. And you can see Sam and I in action there with our chainsaws uh, doing some cutting. Uh, and then on the bottom there is what it looks like after it's been cut. So we cut the tree, we, um, what, what's called bucking it up. So we, we cut it every four to six feet along the trunk and then we score the bark to try and make an effort to open up that bark and kill the beetles. 
Uh, another huge success this year was um, I, I organized an, a Southern Pine Beetle workshop for land managers in the Northeast. Uh, we've been part of a working group for SPB through the North Atlantic Fire Science Exchange, uh, which is a really great organization for information sharing and connecting people in the field. Um, so this was an, our effort to demonstrate to people in the Northeast that haven't had to necessarily deal yet with infestations that are, you know, outbreak related. They have maybe a few detections here and there in, North, in New Hampshire and Massachusetts. Uh, so we really wanted to get those land managers here on Long Island on the ground, along with, you know, Long Island land managers to really get their eyes on these infestations and learn about how to identify and manage this beetle. And then a little bit about, you know, with SPB, it's really the most effective thing you can do is preventative management. And we really focus on thinning and prescribed fire. We really emphasize this proactive uh, preventative management uh, for being really effective for just making the overall forest ecosystem healthier and preventing future outbreaks. So some benefits, like I said, uh, the, the pine trees become stronger and healthier. Uh, it reduces competition for resources like space, sunlight, nutrients, and water. Uh, it increases the pitch production in the trees, which is really the tree's only defense. When the beetle starts pouring in, they attempt to pitch them out. Uh, and then overall resiliency of the forest is what we're aiming for. And we really like encourage this thought of treating the system as a whole rather than individual pests. And this applies to not only southern pine beetle, but any other invasive species you're talking about. And I really like showing these photos that we're taking only two weeks after a burn, and you can see the vigorous regrowth already. It's really exciting to me. And then just to highlight our prescribed fire program, um, we had you know a record year this year for the amount of operations we were able to do. We had our first kind of foray into woodland burning previously. It's really been just focused on grasslands. Uh, so this is really exciting progress for us. And just generally the overarching goals of this prescribed fire program are to increase public safety, reduce wildfire risk, but also improve forest health and strengthen ecosystem resiliency, increase native species diversity, and ensure su suitable habitats for endangered species. Um, you know, and ideally reduce ticks, which you know we run into often in the fields and is not ideal. I'm sure Abby and Melody can also attest to that. Uh, and then I wanted to highlight our collaboration with LISMA. LISMA has been a great partner and really supportive, and we've had ongoing collaboration with them. Um, just in June this past summer, they helped me out with some proactive flagging for Southern Pine Beetle in our burn units. So actually this burn unit here, this is about like six to eight weeks post burn, these pictures. Uh, and this was one of the most impactful spots that we had this year looking at that. It was super exciting to see that regrowth uh, along with, you know, so basically with the fire, sometimes the fire initially stresses the trees and can call in Southern Pine Beetle. There's not really a lot of evidence or research on this. So we're trying to get some, you know, basic knowledge of this where we're, we're proactively flagging the stress trees to know whether it's SPB that killed them or that, that stressed the crown uh, temporarily causing it to go red or yellow, or if, um, you know, or if it's the, the beetle that's actually doing that. So Abby and Haley and their uh, seasonal field tech were really helpful in helping me out that day. And we also had some time to nerd out on some of the other plants that we saw, uh, which you can see in that picture. And then we have ongoing vegetation monitoring uh, and also a pitch pine regeneration study uh, going on. So um, Sam and I regularly go out both pre and post burn to do vegetation monitoring to assess overall species composition and richness and cover. Uh, and then also this might give us some insight onto potential invasive species encroachment uh, and changes in the plant community as we just inevitably disturb the system by uh, implementing this fire. And then another exciting upcoming study that we helped uh, 
collect some data for this summer was uh, a pitch pine regeneration study that's covering the pitch pines native range here in the northeast. Uh, it's a master student named Kathleen Sutzman through University of Vermont. Um, this is a really exciting study and we're looking forward to seeing the outcome of that. And then just quickly covering some of our other priority invasive species. You can see we mainly cover terrestrial plants uh, and animals. Uh, we don't really get into the aquatic too much, um, but yeah, you can go on to the next slide, starting with uh, Chinese silvergrass or miscanthus. Uh, so it's classified as a tier four here on Long Island, which means we can really only locally control it, but it does ha have a high ecological invasiveness ranking. Uh, so we really prioritize grassland sites that are already receiving restoration treatment like fire um, in, a, in an effort to really like have a holistic approach to these, these sites. Uh, so two of the main sites we've been focusing on in my time at the commission are Whiskey Field that's off of Whiskey Road in Rocky Point and Fresh Ponds that's um, near the Calverton National Cemetery. And uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we hosted a volunteer day um, for local land managers and members of the public to come help us dig up uh, this plant. It was um, fairly successful, but we're hoping to fit another one in this season. So keep an eye out on our mailing list if you would like to join us. Um, and you know, upon entering this last season was my first time doing this miscanthus digging. Um, it's been an ongoing project for years now, uh, but we've run into a couple of challenges. Initially, our approach was to dig up the entire root ball and just flip the plant over and attempt to dry out the roots and kill them before they were able to re-sprout. But unfortunately, some of those did end up re-rooting into the ground and sprouting up. Um, so we've shifted towards removing the entire plant. Uh, and we start by cutting off the seed heads just so that those don't disperse while we're digging it up. And then we dig the whole plant and bag it up and throw it in a dumpster. And then we've been doing spotted lantern fly, uh, which is, on everybody's mind, I imagine, uh, this year. It's classified as tier three, so containment here on Long Island. Um, it's a serious threat to native plant communities and agriculture. Um, and we've been focusing on three main sites. So that being the two transfer stations, West Hampton and Hampton Bays, as well as uh, South Haven County Park. Um, we chose these transfer stations because there's a high amount of material being brought in and out of these areas and we're already doing some other invasive species work there. So it's easy for us periodically to go check our traps or do ground surveying. Um, and we've been utilizing I'm, uh, IMAP invasives for that, even if there's no detections, which luckily we have not had any detections of the lanternfly at any of these sites yet this year. Um, so we'll see. And then lastly is caper spurge, which is a tier three uh, moderate invasiveness ranking. and uh, the main site we've been focusing on is the Hampton Bays transfer station that has a sump uh, directly adjacent to their composting facility. So this was a really good opportunity that we saw to really contain this population and prevent it from getting into that compost and then spreading uh, throughout Long Island. And it's one of our success stories. So far, we've been going every couple of weeks this summer and really not finding any plants at the, the transfer station. There's one other site we've been focusing on, which is a dumping site in Quag. And there we only find like one to two plants each time we go. Uh, so really happy with that. And then just looking forward briefly to our future projects um, through you know putting in bur uh, fire lines in South of Currens and also burning and doing some thinning work, all of that disturbance combined has created a bit of an issue for us with buckthorn. Um, buck, there's a you know pretty healthy uh, population of buckthorn surrounding our burn units there in Rocky Point, and it's been encroaching on our uh, burn units. So we're hoping to sort of map out how far it's spread and hopefully get a handle on that. Um, and then we've also mapped a Linden viburnum population in Hampton Bays on the cloverleaf exit uh, of uh, Sunrise Highway. And then we've, in past years, there have been Phragmites populations mapped in the coastal plain ponds in Robert Cushman Murphy. So we're hoping to work with LISMA, hopefully to get in there and start doing some Phragmites removal. 
So yeah, that's my contact information. If you have any questions, um, the next slide has also our mailing list info. Um, you can go to that website and uh, our contact us page. You can sign up for our mailing list and you can pick categories of what you're interested in getting information on. So you're not inundated. Uh, and then also feel free to follow us on Instagram or Facebook. Sam and I do a majority of the posting there. Um, so yeah, we'd be happy if you give us a follow. Hopefully I didn't go over time too much. Okay, good. Thanks. Good question. Um, when Ms. Bell was first born, they came up with a list for Nassau and Suffolk County, working with those counties on what was on the management list, what was banned for sale, what was maybe borderline. Then New York State got involved in and came up with their own list. Now, Ms. Canthus was banned off the original list for sale. And then when New York State developed the list, they said, oh, you could sell it, but you have to put a label on it saying it had an invasive quality. Mm -hmm. So why is something not being done with the New York State invasive list banning Ms. Gantas for sale if it's such a huge problem? Yeah, I'm not quite sure what the answer would be. Just throwing it out there. Yeah, the, uh, there, there is a DEC website that lists the prohibited and regulated if people are interested. But I don't know how that all came about, honestly. Yes perpetuating the problems because it's being sold and people love it and yeah, you see it it's, yeah it's a good point yeah. it's a good point i'm not sure the the reason or how that came about yeah um two great questions we do still do some um bark beetle trapping um, it's just kind of broad spectrum trying to detect any other types of bark beetles or ambrosia beetles, uh, but inevitably we do get some SPB uh, using the alpha pinene lures on the traps. Um, but really on Long Island, it's we're really looking for other emerging uh, bark beetles because SPB is here, it's basically everywhere. <laughs> um, and then the second question was, does fire reduce ticks? Um, in some of our burn units, we've seen it reducing ticks. In that burn unit, I showed where we were with Lisma, where there was vigorous regrowth and it's a somewhat wet site. It's full of ticks still. <laughs> um, it really didn't reduce them that much, but we don't have a lot of data on that. And uh, actually, there's some exciting research emerging from SUNY ESF. I think a new professor there is uh, starting to hopefully study that some more. So hopefully in the coming years, we'll have more data on that. If there's no more questions. I just have a couple handouts. I'm going to put them on the table over there if any of you guys. Thank you, Sabrina. Great work. Sabrina mentioned Southern Pine Beetle. There's another critter, the spotted lanternfly that was confirmed in the Central Pine Barrens in uh, South Manor in October. So, and Southern Pine, uh, Spotted lantern flies are here in Brentwood on the site as well. So they're they're heading east. And there's not a lot we can do about it at this point. Let's do some quick roundtable announcements. We're running a little late on time. If, so if you can keep it to under a minute, and if you have something longer to say, we can do it at the end. We have a, a spot for other business at the end. But if you have a quick less than a minute roundtable announcement, we'll start in the room. Uh, you could probably move up, get closer to a mic if you can. We weren't able to reach the back tables. So uh, does anyone have any roundtable announcements? We'll start over here and go that way. How's that? Any news, events, announcements? All right. Sabrina went, so. Yeah. <laughs> All right.
Mm -hmm. All right. Great work, Southampton. Thank you. Who's next? Um, Nolan, and we were just getting held up here. This is just me, Joseph. Uh, we are currently working in a very large population of Atlantis, or slash Disney Fly. Uh, we have some repeat failures from the rare test of the faithful deforestation and the blooming of the West Indies. Please try to check the whole thing on that. Uh, we do have some behind you on the property for torture this summer with the amount of trees that we need to remove. Um, so in preparation for the move to Scotland, we have a lot of offerings to find there as well as building a little more support for the women and men. Thank you. John? Uh, my name is John Madden, of course, you're going to see me. Sabrina really covered everything. So thank you. <laughs> right. Sabrina's good. She's that good. Nope. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm Ashley Lawrence. I'm the region one EC aquatic invasive species coordinator. Uh, we will sit in doing stuff with what we did at Water Chestnut this year. We have sewage data and stuff right now, but we are wrapping, wrapping up the first year of our herbicide treatment on the botanic, and that went relatively well, and we're doing some public outreach with that right now as well. Thank you, Ashley. Anybody else? Um, I'm Catherine D'Amico. I'm the center director at Theodore Roosevelt Sanctuary and Audubon Center. And this is Julie Nelson. She's our education manager. And Phoebe Clark is our coastal um, resiliency manager. Um, and over at Audubon, we're, of course, you know, most focused on birds and bird-friendly habitats. Um, and we've been offering a series of native plant workshops that are online. So if you want to check us out on Instagram or Facebook, Theodore Roosevelt Sanctuary. Um, you can see those uh, workshops that we've been offering. And we've also been battling invasive forever on our <laughs> properties. So. You probably will be forever. <laughs> We're here to learn. It's guaranteed job. All right, thank you. Good work, great work. Anybody else, updates? Um, I'm Maggie Leverock. I'm the Associate Director of Stewardship with North Carolina Alliance. I'm actually going to be presenting in a few minutes with the Habitat Restoration Project. Um, but I just want to announce that we're really excited to host this Walk in the Woods program at Liz in January. So if anyone's interested in your after for the winter free walk, you can go to our website and submit registration. Um, there we also have a variety of other Walk in the Woods programs throughout the year in a bunch of different areas across Long Island. And um, on March 7th, we're going to be hosting a lecture with Doug Almy. If anyone's interested in coming, um, information will be on our website. You can register there when it's posted. But we'll stop on that to this one for sure. Oh, great. All right. Sounds good. Yeah, good morning. It's Alan Duckworth here. I'm Mary Bath. Okay. <laughs> Long time no see. We used to work together. Any updates, Luke? Yeah. Hey, everyone. Luke Girasi with GEI Consultants. Um, is this the mic over here? Is that? Yeah. I think it'll hear. I think it, yeah. Um, I'll try to be quick in a minute. Just... <laughs> Thank you. Um, just some brief things with some invasive projects that we've been working on. One of them being Westbrook Pond over in uh, by Connecticut Park. Um, Chelsea and I, my colleague, did a Phragmites treatment there to kind of get some of those dense population of Phrag um, under control within that area. Um, I could go into the whole thing of what's going on there, but I'll go for 20 minutes if I do it. So um, that you was one. You can come back and give a presentation on. next year. Sure, yeah, because that's one of the most unique things probably on the island. Um, in the perennial pepper weed job over at West Meadow Beach, with uh, which Abby and Melody joined us to come check it out while we were doing it. Um, numbers have really reduced after two years of treatment there. We were able to hit a new island um, and treat some of that really dense population of it there. Um, just other things, you know, when we do our remote wetland delineations, we're always monitoring for any invasives that we can find, uh, like spotted lanternfly, which we've encountered a number of times now. Um, and not invasive related, just a really cool project. The Carmen's River Fish Passage has been built and is operating now. So if you have the opportunity to go check it out, um, it's really, really cool site to go look at. So you remember that one, Bill? I do. <laughs> yes, that's been a while in the making. So the shovels finally went into the ground and that's uh, up and flowing, not up and running. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Any others, announcements in the room? 
What if folks raise their hand, the remote people in the chat, if they have an announcement? Yeah. This way you wouldn't have to go through every name. Yes. It's, it's hard to do. It gets harder and harder to do roundtable announcements. If anybody virtually uh, has an announcement to make, please uh, raise your hand and I'll be checking here. Yeah. Uh, and then when we call on you, you can unmute yourself. Yeah. So hopefully everybody heard that through the mic, but if you have a roundtable announcement less than a minute, you can raise your hand in the chat and Abby will, will get you. And then we're going to take a 10 minute break. And while we're waiting for that, for the break, the women's room is right across the hall uh, and the men's room is back towards the lobby. I take the, I guess it's like the second right towards the, the lobby for men's room. Let's see if we can unmute and can we hear him? Yeah, good morning, can you hear me? Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Um, if you okay, yeah, okay, good, good morning. It's Alan here from the town of Brookhaven. Uh, I'm just going to highlight two projects. We have funding, new funding from Suffolk County to remove invasives from Cedar Beach, uh, in particular, Japanese knotweed and the tree of heaven, and our ongoing project to restore the marshlands in Mastic Beach will be, it's a planning project, but um, that does have a, a large invasive removal component to it. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Alan. Any hands up? That could be it. Uh, yeah, they can, any other comments people can save to the end or questions? Alexis White, uh, oh, and Rob, Rob will also be up there. Okay, Alexis White uh, said in the chat, her mic isn't working, but um, she's from the Suffolk County Department of Health Services. They're keeping an eye on ticks in the county, including Asian longhorn tick and Gulf Coast ticks. And uh, she thinks those who donated, they're finally back online, so everything. So look forward to chatting with everyone again. Thank you. Lizma found the first Gulf Coast tick in Suffolk County. It was on me. Hey, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, cool. Hey everyone, I'm Rob Lonsrew. I'm with the Friends of Hempstead Plains. I'm also a biologist for the town of Hempstead. Um, on the town end, we just uh, completed the our first foray into the Mayor's Monarch Pledge. We got that in this week. Uh, we filled out about uh, 11 action items, I believe, for our first year. We're really looking to do more next year. Uh, we managed close to an acre of um, pollinator land in terms of either self-managed, whereas they were natural areas that were promoting uh, management with our parks departments or established gardens that us and our department with volunteers created to obviously increase habitat. And then at the Hempstead Plains, we um, are happy to announce that we'll be performing our first prescribed burn there since the early to mid 90s, so almost 30 years ago. Um, so we're very excited to um, get that going. I think we're planning to burn about four acres of the 19 acre parcel. So uh, look for more information there. Hopefully have some of our partners out to, um, to experience it. I'm very excited for that. So thanks for everyone uh, meeting up today and happy holidays to all. Thank you, Rob.